we saw that existing older models of uh, price and wage rigidity, whether it's a Keynesian model uh, of uh, price or wage rigidity that we have in, that was formalized in disequilibrium models, um, or whether it's the Calvo pricing that you have in the new Keynesian model. Um, they do uh, uh, violate uh, sometimes um, bilateral efficiency. Uh, which is problematic. It means that either um, trades occur that actually generate a negative joint surplus, so which would be puzzling because in that case, um, you know, buyer and seller would be better off to cancel the trade. Um, and it also means that sometimes you have trades that could generate a positive surplus, but, but that don't occur. And again, here it would be puzzling in practice because buyer and seller could um, you know, sit down together and alter um, the terms of trade so that the, the trade actually takes place. And, and, uh, and of course, because there is a joint positive surplus, both seller and buyer could uh, be better off. So you have Pareto improvements available. Um, so we, we saw that this Keynesian and Dukensian uh, model bilateral efficiency was sometimes uh, violated, uh, which is an issue. In our model of Slack, um, although we can assume any price norm, um, bilateral efficiency will always be satisfied. Um, and so that, I think, is an asset of the model that uh, bi bilateral efficiency is always respected. Um, so let's try to see why that's the case. And um, to see that, we'll just need to rely on the results that we've established earlier when we computed the individual and bilateral surpluses from trade. So we computed the surplus for the buyer, surplus for the seller, as well as the joint surplus from trade. And from this result, we can establish that bilateral efficiency indeed um, is always respected in the model. And that's for any, uh, any price norm, actually. Yeah. Um, So bilateral efficiency is respected for any price norm. And so um, we can, to, to establish that, uh, there are two things that we have to establish. First, it means that all trades that occur um, generate a positive joint surplus. So we have to establish that. So basically, it means that the model This means that the model of Slack is immune to the uh, real rule critique. So all trades that occur generate a positive joint surplus. Um, and we saw that uh, that's, we saw earlier that that's not the case actually uh, of the, uh, that's not the case of the new Keynesian model, which is uh, subject to the Rue and Rio's rule critique. Um, and so, um, so how do we know that all trades that occur generate a positive joint surplus? Well, we saw, we established uh, that earlier. Um, we saw that uh, the surplus from any trade in model of Slack is um, the total surplus T strictly greater than zero. Uh, and we, you know, if uh, 
if we go back to uh, if we go back to the earlier result, what we had showed is that t is equal to um, And so we know that the surplus from any trade in our model of stack is positive because we, we established earlier that the total surplus uh, total surplus from trade was 1 over 1 plus k, um, epsilon minus 1 over epsilon, u over p minus 1 over epsilon times 1 plus tau x. And we established that in uh, when we looked at the individual and uh, bilateral surplus from trade. And in fact, so this is our total surplus uh, from trade. So you can see that um, you can see that uh, t uh, Um, we see that the total surplus from trade is uh, strictly greater than zero. Um, so that appears immediately. And in fact, um, something that we had established earlier is that one here, that's uh, the share of the surplus that goes uh, to um, the seller. And this tau x that we have here that the share of the surplus that goes to the buyer. That's something that we had established as well uh, earlier. So here we see the total surplus that puts together the share that goes to the buyer and the share that goes um, that goes to the seller. Uh, and so we see here that T is uh, strictly greater than zero. And so that's why we could say that uh, that's what we could say that there is uh, there is a positive joint surplus in any trade. So that's one part uh, that's one part of the argument. All trades that occur that generate a positive joint surplus. Okay, and then the other part uh, of the argument that we need to make to establish um, bilateral efficiency is that there are no trade that could occur and could generate a joint surplus, but that do not occur. You know, we do not uh, forego any trade that could generate a joint uh, surplus that's positive. No potential uh, trades. that could generate a positive joint surplus are uh, foregone. So in the model, we do not forego potential trade that could generate a positive joint surplus. So in that way, um, the model of Slack is immune to critique by barrel. Um, because uh, barrel criticize all models, uh, old model of uh, wide rigidity in particular, because in this model, there are potential trades that could generate a positive joint surplus, but that were uh, forgone. And so in particular, you know, firms would fire workers um, Although there might be in the long run a positive joint surplus from that relationship, just because in the short run they were not able, uh, you know, to uh, negotiate with the worker and cooperate to get uh, temporarily a lower um, a lower wage, and so that's unlike. So the fact that the our model of Slack is immune to that critique of Barrow that's unlike uh, the disequilibrium models. And so how do we know that there are no potential trades that could generate a positive joint surplus and that, that do not uh, occur? How do we know that? Well, um, I guess there are two parts to this argument. So first of all, uh, 
for trend for uh, trade to be a potential trade it has to uh, you know seller and buyer have to get together through the matching function um, so that's the thing is that a, a, a trade has a potential to occur only if buyer and seller have come together through the matching function any potential trade <coughs> Uh, between uh, must occur through the matching function. That's because the matching function uh, dictates uh, all the uh, meetings between buyers and sellers. So buyer and seller cannot meet outside of the matching function. So that's the first part is that if there is a potential trade, uh, any potential trade, it has to be um, Test workers through the matching function. And the second thing, so, okay, the set of potential trades is all the trades that the matching function give. And another question is, do we know that all these trades actually, uh, do we know NN? So what we know is that any uh, potential thread sh through the matching function So these are the trades that occur through the match. So any potential trade that occurs through the matching function, we know that it generates a positive uh, joint surplus. That's what we established uh, earlier. So joint surplus, total surplus is positive. Okay, so the set of potential trades are the trades given by the matching function. Any of these trades gives a positive surplus. So now the question is, uh, do we know that all these trades are going to actually occur? If they all occur, then we're immune to the barrel critic. If there are some trades that actually do not occur, although they would generate a positive surplus, then we are not immune to that critic. Um, but we know that, in fact, uh, all of these potential trades are going to occur in practice. And how do we know that? Well, that's because the buyer and the seller, they are always happy to proceed with the trade because buyer and seller, they always receive a positive individual surplus. And so, you know, buyer and seller meet and they know that they'll receive, you know, without any negotiation, just for the given price norm, they always get a positive surplus, so they'll always be happy to proceed. If one was getting a positive surplus, one was getting a negative surplus, but the sum of the surpluses was positive, then they would need to have some renegotiation between buyer and seller to find a way to split that positive joint surplus in a way that's agreeable for both parties. Um, and you know, they would have to think about how the negotiation occurs. But that, here, that's not even the case. Anytime they meet with the matching function, each of the two parties, buyer and seller, they, they get away with a positive surplus. So they're always happy to proceed with the match. Um, so we know that all potential. Uh, any potential trade will always occur. And so that's because uh, in any potential trade for any price norm, uh, the buyer surplus which we denoted by B is positive and the seller surplus which we denoted by S is also positive which means that uh, buyer and seller they are always happy to proceed with the trade. Uh, 
Um, and we saw what this uh, buyer and seller uh, surpluses were. Um, so seller surplus is just going to be one over one plus key epsilon minus one over epsilon mu over p minus one over epsilon. And then the buyer surplus is the same multiplied by two over x. Um, So from that, we conclude that uh, we conclude that any trade that potentially uh, provide a positive joint surplus will occur. And so uh, through these two uh, results, that any trade that does occur give positive joint surplus and any trade that could provide a positive joint surplus also occurs, we can establish that bilateral efficiency is always uh, satisfied. And the key thing here is that that's for any price norm. There is no restriction on the price norm that we can assume. 